Joining us now from Washington, D.C. is Stuart Rhodes, who is the founder of the Montana-based Oath Keepers, which is a military outreach organization. Stuart, talk to us. Uh, the word on the street right now is that the NDAA is on everybody's lips. Uh, do you feel that the NDAA threatens our rights as citizens according to our Constitution? Yes, absolutely. It's, it's the most dangerous law ever enacted because it wipes away the, the core protections against arbitrary power. In fact, everything our, our Constitution was meant to prevent, and especially our Bill of Rights. So uh, opponents of the NDAA fear that the act could be used against American citizens who are simply exercising their First Amendment rights in peaceful protests. Do you agree that this could possibly happen? Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, it, it, that's just for your First Amendment rights, it's all your rights. It wipes away the due process protections, the requirement for a grand jury indictment, and also for a jury trial, uh, which is exactly the, one of the causes of arms for taking up arms in a revolution, and also the same exact thing that, that the Hitler, Hitler regime did, the Nazis, and also what Stalin did in Russia. It's the same kind of, same pattern. You take away all the protections to protect the individual citizen from being grabbed and detained arbitrarily, from being tried by some kangaroo court and executed. It's, it's, it's the same thing. So describe for me a real or perhaps hypothetical situation where an American citizen could be actually detained indefinitely and without trial under the NDAA? Well, don't think of the Padilla case, which, which happened before the NDAA was passed. Um, back in, just after, after 2001, when 11 attacks, you had an American citizen, Jose Padilla, detained, I believe it was 2002, and he was held in a brig in South Carolina for three years in military detention. No indictment, no trial, nothing, just held. And so that's a good example right there. That's something that already happened. So the NDAA, what it really did, it's not out of the blue. This is not the first time this has happened in modern history. But what the, what the NDAA does is it codifies and gives congressional authorization for the interpretations of power that were already used to detain American citizens by the Bush administration. And it also helps to support what Obama's doing. Because Obama's gone one step further and he's begun to kill American citizens. You know, the targeted assassination of Al Waki and his son. So this is this is the problem, though. Is that now Congress is giving a rubber stamp, its full approval to this interpretation of the power of the president as being unlimited, as being you know he could do the same thing to American as he could do to Iraqi citizens. You know, someone suspected of being part of the insurgency in Iraq is just grabbed off the street. There's no requirement to go to a judge for for a search warrant or for an arrest warrant. They just go get them and they hold them as long as they want to for the duration of the conflict. This is, this is bringing the laws of war home to America. So do you think that the FD, I'm, I'm sorry, the NDAA could actually affect the average beat cop on the street? Well, sure, because your average beat cop on the street is, is now going to, here's the problem, is I've talked to many veterans across the country who have said to me, look, how do I know when I'm pulled over for a traffic stop with a normal stop? How do I know I'm not going to be taken into, and turned over to the military for military custody? And so and I told him, well, you know, it's unlikely now, but that's the road we're headed down. We're headed down a road where, and, you know, increasingly you'll be at risk of being taken into the second track. And so the mindset of a lot of veterans out there and other people who are concerned about this is, well, if I don't know if I'm going to get a chance for a fair trial, then I'm going to fight and then resist. I'm not going to allow myself to be taken into custody. And so that's, that's kind of their mindset. When you turn down the protections um, of due process, where you have a right to confront your accusers and a right to a jury trial, when you strip that away, you make people much more fearful and desperate. And so that is going to put police officers in danger. Well, do you think that there's a tie-in, perhaps, to the, to the lists that the government is creating, such as the no-fly list? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the no-fly list is a good example of how arbitrary this can be. There are people on the no-fly list that have no idea why. They won't tell you why. It's all considered top-secret information. And there have been people who want them on the no-fly list um, for being outspoken critics of the, of the administration. And there have also been folks on the no-fly list because they have the same last name as somebody else. You know, So there's, there's, there's no other reason. You have no idea why you're on the no-fly list. That's kind of what will happen down the road, too, with these detentions. You won't know why you're being detained. No one will tell you. And it could be a, 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 just an accident. That's already happened to foreigners who've been detained pursuant to a so-called war powers of the president. You wanted the people who had the same last name as another guy 
uh, take it off. One guy was Canadian to take it off to, I believe he was taken off to Syria and tortured. And then later on they found out they had the wrong guy and then they released him. And then he, tra- he tried to sue, and then they said he had the right to sue. So, you know, it's already happened. The wrong guy has been grabbed up and tortured uh, when it comes to foreigners. So you can expect the exact same thing to happen to U.S. citizens, too. Now, you been, been you done critics, you, Stuart, you mentioned critics of the president. And, and since the president is the commander-in-chief of the armed forces, he could ultimately abuse the, the NDAA to squelch voices who oppose him. Is this correct? I mean, what, what is to stop him from doing this? Well, nothing. According, according to this, this theory of executive power, um, he decides who the enemy is, he decides what must be done about it, and there's no limitation, really, other than his own, his own judgment. And this is exactly upside down from the system of government the founders gave us. It was a system of, of laws, not men, not relying on the goodness, of the, the benevolence of the dictator. But instead, under our system of government, as originally intended, no one in the government can take your rights or your liberty from you or your life. No one can take your, take your liberty or your life away from you, only your only injury of your peers. No one in the government. This takes that away and says, no, the president himself will decide whether or not you're the enemy, and he can even decide you killed. You might not even get a military trial or get a chance to challenge your detention. He might simply order a predator drone to fly over your house and use a hellfire missile and kill you. And, you know, of course, it sounds far-fetched that to happen, but in legal principle, they've already crossed the Rubicon. They've already killed an American citizen off of a list, intentionally targeting him and his teenage son for, for being executed by hellfire missile, and they did it. And so what's the difference between Al Milwaukee and you? There's no legal difference. It's only a political difference, only what they can get away with politically. And that's not how it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be an absolute bar a constitutional uh, barrier against arbitrary power. Well, let's talk about the political differences here because President Obama criticized George Bush in the past for abusing the Patriot Act, which initially covered a limited time period. But then President Obama approved its continuation. Now President Obama is an outspoken advocate of the NDAA. What is your perspective on his turnaround? Well, I was still surprised. I mean, this, this, is, this is the problem, is that only when they're outside of power do people oppose that power. Once they get it, then they enjoy it for themselves. And it's been the pattern of presidents that continuously grow and expand the power of the presidency, whether they're a Republican or Democrat. So it, it's not it wasn't a surprise to me at all. Now, let's, let's take a look at Guantanamo Bay for a moment here, because we have examples of suspected terrorists being indefinitely detained in Guantanamo Bay. And, and their detention remains controversial. What, in your opinion, do you think should be done with those prisoners? Well, it's, it's a tough one because we're not in a declared war. And so you, you have a war against the, against the tactic. You have a war against terrorism that is wide open. And so there are people being detained who are from countries, even outside of Afghanistan and Iraq, you know, countries they're not even at war with. And so I think it's a... It's, it's a um, even when it comes to non-U.S. citizens, it's very problematic. Now, like I said earlier, there's, there's already been several foreigners who've been detained and then, you know, wrongfully detained, having the wrong guy, and then tortured, and then after it's found out that the wrong guy, they let them go. So there's already been abuses. So I think I think the first the first threshold is we should have a declared war. We should have declared wars, and then those define who is subject to military jurisdiction. I think when you get beyond that and start doing other things outside of that, that limitation of the declared war, then you start having problems. I don't think I don't think it's smart for us, and I think it's right to treat the entire world as a battlefield and to say we can use a military force against absolutely anyone in the entire world. That's very dangerous. I think it leads to more anger and hatred against the United States. It makes us look like the bad guys. All right, Stuart, thank you for uh, taking time from your schedule today, and we look forward to having you back on the show. Great, thanks a lot. All right, that was Stuart Rhodes, the founder of Oath Keepers from Washington, D.C., and we will be right back.